of America's 250th by interpreting and preserving Tennessee's unique stories, objects, landmarks, and places across our diverse state that define who we are as Tennesseans and Americans. So like I said, this is just getting started, and so um, there'll probably be more to come. Um, for some of you who do genealogy research, who use the site Family Search, I have a huge announcement. The Houston County Archives is now an affiliate library. If you don't know what that is, um, they're all across the United States. Sometimes they're hard to get into because they're not open very often. We're open Monday through Friday. Um, what an affiliate library is, is that you can access records that are a normal person if you were to get on your computer, sign in, go to the catalog want to look at a set of records and it's locked, you can actually come to the archives now and use your own sign in on our patron computer and those records are now being unlocked to you. And so you don't have to go to Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, or even Dixon or Montgomery <coughs> County or some of the other places where they're located. So um, I've been working on that for several months now. We actually had to have um, uh, a static IP um, actually installed so that we could do that. They required it, uh, and so uh, we were able to do that. It cost us a little bit of money, but it was something I think it was well worth it for us to have those records <coughs> available. Um, and also, you all will remember last year we got a, uh, last year, last month, we got a donation from Susan Knight Gore of $100 to our project to purchase items off of eBay that are from Houston County. And so I wanted to share with you some of the things that we've been able to purchase. Um, these are some envelopes that are addressed to a Miss Mary Carpenter in Kentucky, Bowling Green, Oakland. Um, this one is actually has a return. This one actually has a return address of W. C. Shelton, attorney at law in Erin. But these are all postmarked in Erin from 1889 and 1890. The other thing that we got were some very well-preserved old documents. These are all dated um, 1906, 1903, 1920, from the B.R. Harris uh, Limeworks. Um, very, very nice business letter here uh, for B.R. Harris. And then we got one from the E.W. Rosha Arlington and Erin Line. This is from 1920. They're all really crisp and really in great condition. Um, so we were very, very happy to get these. And um, the last thing before I introduce our speaker, we recently got a donation from um, uh, Deborah, uh, Miss Betty Nolan Wren, a scrapbook. Um, and a lot of, there's a lot of newspaper clippings, some very interesting documents and things. But this was in there, you all will, be, will remember this and will know this, but this is an article about the Lewis brothers that were in World War I. This magazine is the American Legion Monthly from April 1932. Many of you have seen this photograph of the Lewis brothers. The article is, is wonderful. Um, it says, Fighting Brothers, I was gonna read it real quick because it's only a couple of paragraphs. Perhaps the reason the war ended when it did was that Field Marshal Van Hindenburg had heard that the four more Lewis brothers of Erin, Tennessee were packing up ready to go to training camps. I thought that was funny. Had the war lasted, Mr. and Mrs. Albert L. Lewis of Erin would have had 11 sons in uniform of Uncle Sam. Can you imagine 11 sons? Houston County Post of Erin wonders whether any other post can beat its record of having as members six of the seven Lewis brothers who did serve in, in the World War. When the Post adjutant calling the roll reaches the name of Lewis, he reads Horace L., Luther A., Dallas R., Walter E., William L., and Charles E. The seventh, Lonnie M. Lewis, was killed in action in Belgium. Five of the brothers served in Company L, 119th Infantry, 30th Division. All six of the legionnaires of Houston County Post are farmers. They belong to the oldest stock of their section of Tennessee, and like Alvin M. York, were raised true to the squirrel hunting traditions of marksmanship. Their post believes it would be hard to find six better shots at any other post. It is willing to back them in a match with regulation army rifles against any other team of six brothers if it can be found in the American Legion. 
Formerly, he served as park manager at Johnsonville State Historic Park, as director of state historic sites for the Tennessee Historical Commission, and as park historian at the Pamphlet. Mm -hmm. Pamphlet, thank you. Historic Park and National Museum of the Civil War Soldier in Petersburg, Virginia. Originally from Clarksville, Tennessee, Jerry is an American history and public uh, history graduate of Austin Peay State University, Murray State University, and Middle Tennessee State University. Jerry has researched, written, presented programs about the Civil War for most of his professional life. He serves on the Tennessee Civil War Preservation Association Board of Directors and is a frequent speaker at Civil War Roundtables, historic organizations, state and national parks and museums, and historical societies. So please welcome Ms. Kimberly. having me here today, um, this evening. I know it's been a, we're almost to the end of this world win year. Um, you know, <clears throat> just having dinner here with Clint just a few minutes ago. He and I have known each other for a very long time. Um, I think we're still trying to figure out if we're actually related because my side of the family are Bumpuses from Cumberland Furnace and I grew up in Clarksville and I think Clint kind of has the same <laughs> with the Van Lear connection. Um, but we have been uh, associated for many years, but I'm very pleased to be here. Um, this is kind of like my community, and I enjoy talking, talking about history subjects, especially Civil War, uh, in my own area where I grew up. So um, tonight I'm going to be talking to you about my, I, it used to be new, it's already two years old now, we lost a year because of COVID. But I'm going to be talking to you about Johnsonville. Um, as you know, Johnsonville is in Humphreys County. Um, most of you know where Humphreys County is, just a little bit south of here. You may not have known that, you know, when Stewart County was getting delved up, you know, Stewart County used to, used to extend from the top of Tennessee to the Alabama line, and then it was eventually divided up, and when that division took place in 1807, two years later in 1809, there was Humphreys County. So it was all Stewart County, and eventually the first county that came after that was Humphreys County, where Johnsonville is located. Um, prior to the word Johnsonville, there was a significant town that had developed in this region known as Reynoldsburg. Um, I know we were trying to figure out if, if, there, if the Reynolds name is actually associated with that. I think we've concluded that it is not, right? <laughs> um, but Reynoldsburg was one of the earlier towns. It's another part of my book. I am working on a second follow-up to Johnsonville. Um, who knows, it might be a... Uh, a TriStar series that's Waverly, Reynoldsburg, and Johnsonville, then I'll have covered all of Humphreys County. Um, but Reynoldsburg is a big part of this. Um, the next book, I hope, is a lot of the information that I cut out of the Reynoldsburg portion of this book uh, will become its own book. At least that's my goal right now. It's not going to be a bestseller. But it's very important to this community because, you know, while you had Reynoldsburg, you had other early towns such as Port Royal, and Palmyra. So you had, whoa, and the lights went out. Not, not quite yet. Oh. There. <laughs> but I like your enthusiasm. <laughs> um, I didn't want to put everybody to sleep this early, okay? <laughs> um, but no, I, I, I hope to be working on that over the, over the winter. Is my goal to have the Reynoldsburg book uh, as a follow-up to this, which a lot, includes a lot of local history, especially Houston County, where it eventually became Houston County. So tonight, I'm going to be talking to you about the book. Um, I know the time limit. I know my 45 minutes, so I'm going to try to get through a lot of this. I do have some really great slides to share with you. Um, this is an all-encompassing story. First of all, before we get to that, who's been to Johnson? I mean, how many of you have actually been down there? Hopefully, if you haven't, you'll make a, you'll schedule a trip. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't affected by the recent floods in Waverly. Um, that watershed spilled out into the Trace Creek, which is a big part of my book. 
the history of Trace Creek, basically the valley that intertwines beginning in Dixon County and, and empties out in the Tennessee River is a big part of this story. And the Trace Creek Valley, or the um, Trace Creek Meadows, as they used to call it, um, <clears throat> services as the centerpiece of the Johnsonville story. So before we get into the Civil War section, I'll tell you a little bit about one of the reasons, few of the reasons that got me started on this. So, as Melissa mentioned, I had uh, completed my PhD at Middle Tennessee State University in 2015. Um, this was a this evolved out of my dissertation, my research for my dissertation. Uh, as at that time, I was park manager of the Johnsonville site. I knew that I had a story to tell there that had never been told. You know, I had read, being a Civil War historian for years, all the actions about Nathan Bedford Forrest and the Battle of Johnsonville and all those activities that took place, but I noticed that there had never been any story that actually told about what Johnsonville was and why it was there, what was going on on the inside of this convoluted compound of 90 acres that included everything from civilians to the quartermaster's department, to U.S. Naval personnel, to Army personnel, um, lots of artillery and cavalry. You had basically everything involved in the picture of a Civil War battle all meshed together in about a 90-acre compound that was called Johnsonville. So I thought, man, this would be a fascinating story. So some of those questions that I wanted to ask initially starting off was, you know, what did the interior of that place look like? Was it completely clear cut? Or is it that heavily wooded area that you see when you go and you see this tree park today? Was the wharf, you know, the wharf with the surface where the boats pulled up, was it magmatized or was it was it just a muddy pull-in for these for these deep draft vessels that plied the Tennessee River? Um, was it mainly just barracks and tents or were there administration buildings? You know, how did the trains uh, that came from Nashville picking up supplies get turned around when they got there and head back in the direction because it was just a single track. As a matter of fact, when you leave Dixon today, as you're driving along Highway 70, that railroad track to your right is the same railroad track. It's just been built up on by CSX Railroad owns that today, but that is the Nash eventually which became the um, Nashville, Chattanooga, and St. Louis Railroad. But before that, it was the Nashville and Northwestern Railroad built for the purpose of supplying Johnsonville in the Civil War. So we have a Civil War era railroad that's still in use today. There's only a few in Virginia that are still in use, but the National Northwestern Railroad, which is a big focal point of the book, is that same 78 mile piece of track that goes from basically New Johnsonville today to Nashville, Tennessee. It's 78 miles long. It's still used multiple times a day. So there was a lot of things, you know, that I also I want, you know, like the soldiers that were garrisoned there, what were they doing on a regular basis? Um, I was very fortunate, you know, as, as most historians want, as you all know as genealogists and historians, you look for that hook, that special hook that's going to sell a story or it's going to make a story. You got to, and that hook is usually a personal connection. So. I was down there working in the park one day, doing my duties as park manager, and this, this guy in this green Subaru Outback station wagon drove past and stopped. And he said, hey, uh, you know anything about the troops that, that were here? And I said, um, yeah, I'm doing some research on them. I'm actually working on a dissertation about the place right now. And he's like, oh, because, I mean, and he pulled over on this little gravel sidewalk, and he opened the trunk of this Subaru Outback, and he pulled out this blue tote. And he had 400 letters written from Johnsonville from his great-grandfather that was stationed there in the Civil War. And you know, here we are, we're all genealogists, it's all just exploding out of our heads that this is the story, this is the hook. As it turns out, his ancestor was Lorenzo Atwood, he was a corporal in the 43rd Wisconsin, and the 43rd Wisconsin was the main garrison assigned to Johnsonville, the main infantry garrison. He had anecdotes in there of day-to-day -day activities, and most of all, he had hand-drawn maps on these letters that he had sent to his wife, Cordelia, in Wisconsin, explaining, giving visual depictions of what the inside of Johnsonville looked like. I mean, this is a historian's dream. So this came about, which eventually made the book. Some of those letters and some of those drawings I included in the book, so if you don't have this, 
I'm selling these tonight. That's not. <laughs> I guess it is. It'll, uh, good boy. So, uh, secondly, uh, as I mentioned, the full story of telling this fantastic story of Johnsonville was not an easy task. I knew that the focus was not going to be just on a battle, but it was going to be on many entities involved, as I explained earlier. Uh, I knew that by writing the story using Atwood's letters, and especially from five photographs taken by a Civil War photographer who was a protege of George Bernard. And if you're familiar with George Bernard, if you've ever seen any Civil War pictures, photograph of the city of Nashville taken in the Civil War, taken especially from the Capitol, he took one epic shot while the Battle of Nashville is going on. Uh, Clint, tomorrow, right? Isn't tomorrow the anniversary of the Battle of Nashville? Yep. 15th and 16th. He stood on a hill and took all these shots. Well, a protege working for him was a, was a, a young man by the name of Jacob Coonley. And Jacob Coonley contracted through Montgomery Mix, who was the quartermaster general, to take his caboose, his photographic rail car, down the Nashville and Northwestern Railroad en route to Johnsonville, taking photographs of the magnific magnificent train trestles from Nashville to Johnsonville. There were 26 total. And if you go to the town of McEwen today, if you're on Highway 70, as you're coming from Dixon, it sweeps down through this long valley right before you, the road turns up and you come and you enter the town from the east. That valley was an expansive, one of the largest railroad trestles ever constructed in the Civil War. And that was one of these that he photographed. Wow. When he got to Johnsonville, he snapped a series of photographs. There's five that we know that exist. I've been to the Library of Congress. I've taken the original plates out and have examined the plates. On the back of the plates are scratched in 1123, which tells me since these were taken in 1864, he took those November the 23rd, which makes sense because the Battle of Johnsonville unfolded on November the 4th and 5th. He showed up just weeks after that photographing the compound. So some of those slides I'm going to share with you tonight are, are, are those pictures. Um, and finally, the other missing element of the story was that of the people, the, of, of the story that most people are more familiar with, which is the actions of Major General Nathan Bedford Forrest. Um, you know, he conducted one of the most audacious campaigns of the American Civil War. He left Corinth, Mississippi on October the 12th, with the plans to ride into West Tennessee, his fourth raid, by the way, to ride into West Tennessee to secure new mounts, and especially it was a recruiting mission to recruit, to make new recruits. Keep in mind, as we get into the slides here, that in the fall of 1864, especially in October and November, the Confederacy is losing the war, and they're losing badly. They needed something to happen, whether it was going to be new recruits, um, taking, taking a, an entire new action, uh, an offensive north into Kentucky and eventually into Ohio. There were a lot of plans that had evolved at this point. However, in early, in early November of 1864, he's given permission by his, um, by his superior, Lieutenant Richard Taylor, to take a <coughs> contingent of about 3,000 troopers in, and mounted infantry into West Tennessee. This eventually ends up being one of his greatest campaigns of the war and what unfolds here at Johnsonville is a result of that. So those are three main topics that I'm going to get into tonight's talk. So with that, I think it's time for lighting. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> this is where we really get people to sleep after that nice wonderful dinner. Which, by the way, kudos to whoever brought those turnip greens. I, uh, I'm a huge fan of growing up on turnip greens, and whoever brought those tonight, kudos to you. Merry Christmas, there. Okay, go ahead. So, I'm gonna, just very quickly, so Johnsonville becomes this Union supply. I'm just going to give you an overview here, real quickly. Um, it was built as a quick fix solution in the in, late in the Civil War, beginning in August of 1863. It eventually became the largest supply operation in the Western theater of the Civil War. It was only second to a 
Virginia supply operation at City Point, Virginia, but it eventually became one of the largest on the Tennessee River. Okay. It's named after this man, unfortunately. Um, this is Andrew Johnson, a uh, staunch unionist from Tennessee. He eventually becomes President Lincoln's vice president in 1864, but prior to that, he had been appointed as a military governor for the state of Tennessee. This had been tried in North Carolina and Louisiana had failed. So in March, early March, after the Union occupies Nashville, Lincoln appoints Andrew Johnson as a military governor, and with that came the rank of Brigadier General. So if you became a, if you're a governor, you're elected by civilians. If you're appointed as a military governor, that comes with a military rank of a brigadier general. So you, you could not, you, you didn't have to go to a military academy, as he did not. He'd been a former congressman, and he's appointed, much like Gideon Pillow, who had never had any prior military experience, uh, and is made a brigadier general in the Mexican War, and again here in the Civil War. But Andrew Johnson is a big part of this story, and Johnsonville is named after this. I don't really want to say what I want to say about him, but uh, we'll just leave it at that. Andrew Johnson is na Johnsonville's name for this guy. Okay, let's go to the next. So there's there's a whole other program on Andrew Johnson that we may have to get into one night. Um, I'll show you this because this is the terminus of a railroad that went to Johnsonville. This is the terminus of the of the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad, and just a little bit south of here is where the Nashville and Northwestern Railroad that went to Johnsonville came into these very tracks. If you're looking at the state capitol up on the far back side of that photo. If you're familiar with Nashville today, if you're on Charlotte Avenue climbing the hill to the state capitol, you go by the Tennessee State University Avon Williams campus on your right. When you go underneath that viaduct, that railroad trestle, which by the way still has the Civil War era stone piers, that's where this building sits today. So if you kind of picture that in your mind, that's exactly how close this was to the state capitol. And you can see, at that time, you know, the capitol was just finished in 1859. This is 1864. This is only, you know, the building's only five years old. And all through the Civil War, there would be remnants of the hand-cut limestone that was quarried just a mile from the state capitol, all scattered around the building itself. Okay, because so why was it neat? In 1862 there was a drought. <clears throat> Union commanders feared the Cumberland River was too shallow to support these deep draft supply transport vessels needed to carry supplies from places like Cincinnati, St. Louis, Paducah. All those would use the rivers to come into the massive wharf at Nashville. Go to the next slide. If you're familiar with Nashville, that's First Avenue today, you know, where they have the where they have the Fourth of July fireworks and the riverfront. That's what it looks like 10 years after the Civil War. I did not, I was not able to locate an image of this, especially the wharf in Nashville that was a Civil War era. I don't know if one exists, or probably is, but it's not in any kind of photographic collection at the Tennessee State Library and Archives. But this does give you some sense, just 10 years after the war, of how shallow and, you know, the wharf there is not very steep, so you can imagine when the Cumberland River rises, just like today, those buildings were getting flooded. In 2010, when we had that flood, and it made it all the way up Broadway, I'm sure they were suffering from the same kind of flooding without dammed rivers at this time as well. So. Is there another water back there that I possibly get my hands on? So to resolve this, major supply issue, Johnson and the, and the commanders in Nashville decided to construct an alternative route, thank you so much, to the deeper channel Tennessee River. So you've got this drought going on to kind of put this together. I told you this was a convoluted story, so <coughs> follow me closely. You got the Cumberland River in Nashville that's suffering from a drought. They fear that they may have to abandon Nashville to the deeper channeled Tennessee River. So they decide we're going to build a railroad to connect Nashville to the Tennessee River. Supply boats dock at the, ten at the deeper channel Tennessee River, which at Johnsonville was 60 feet. 
60 feet deep, it's still there today, even though it's been dredged out, it's a little bit, it's a little deeper there now in the middle of the channel. So they move their operation, go to the next slide. So they choose a existing riverboat landing, um, a place called Lucas Landing. And if you know if, you're, if you've never dug into the history of the landings along the Tennessee River, you know you got Paris Landing, you got Cuba Landing, Lucas Landing, Pittsburgh Landing, um, Mouse Tail Landing. You know all these landings didn't just gain their name when the park system decided to put parks at these places. These were these were pre Civil War <coughs> riverboat landings that had been established. Some of them 40 years, like Lucas Landing, before the Civil War. So Lucas Landing was being used as a supply docking area in the 1820s. That was documented, and I put that in the first section of the chap the first chapter of the book. So Lucas Landing, go to the next photo. And this, there we are. I don't need to show you all where Humphreys County is, but when I give these talks in Virginia, they don't know I have a clue where Humphreys County is. So go to the next slide. This came to me from a, a local here uh, in Humphreys County. <coughs> who had a photograph of Lucas Landing about taken about 1890. I about flipped out when I saw this. As you can still see the unflooded river. You can see where Forrest probably would have attacked the, the depot on November without the flooding. You know, the, the day when you go there, you see the flooded Kentucky Reservoir. But in 1864, this still looks like, this is only 30 years after the Civil War. So this gives us some idea. I'm not sure what that building is on the far right, but that's pretty much the view that you have today, except it's a mile across the river now. Here you're looking at the 380 yard wide river channel that fronted, eventually fronted Johnson. So next slide, please. Are we looking north? Yes, sir. You're looking north like you're looking toward Paris, Paris Landing. So in 1863, under the Army, Governor Johnson orders construction of a military railroad to the Tennessee River. Next slide. And he puts this man in charge of the construction of the railroad, Colonel William Ennis, who um, was quite an engineer. He eventually becomes the commander of the U.S. Military Railroad Department. And he's charged by Johnson to oversee construction of this railroad. Unfortunately, he's taken off of the project and moved, you know, as the war progresses rapidly south, he is in charge of the railroad construction closer to Chattanooga. And his replacement, go to the next slide, ends up being another man I'll show you in just a minute. Um, the labor, however, that, need, that was needed to build this, with all the available white construction laborers, they had a ready source of recently freed slaves and black men and women, especially in the Nashville area and these surrounding counties. So, men would be impressed into the Union Army to help construct this railroad. Look at the next slide. Probably this, this man, I'm going to guess, is probably one of those impressed gentlemen. You can see he's wearing a four-button sack coat. But that would have been very representative of what maybe one of those impressed laborers looked like. Go to the next one. I know you all seen this if you looked at a lot of Civil War books. That's, an, that's a staged photograph, by the way like most Civil War photographs, because they had to hold the frame. But this is men at Murfreesboro, Tennessee, impressed laborers working on railroad. You would have seen this would have been a very common sight from Kingston Springs to Johnsonville. And I mentioned Kingston Springs because 28 miles of track had already been laid prior to the Civil War with the intention of continuing a railroad to cross the Tennessee River somewhere at Lucas Landing to connect with an existing railroad that had already started on the opposite side of the, of the Tennessee River, brought down from Mayfield, Kentucky, you all know about Mayfield, unfortunately, two days ago, to Hickman, Kentucky, eventually to McKenzie, Tennessee, and from McKenzie, Tennessee, it would hook up, and those tracks had already been laid due to the, the, the Great Panic of 1857, which was the First Depression, everything stopped. So it picks back up for the first time in 1863, and you would have seen sites like this with impressed laborers every day. That's, a, that's not Tennessee, that's actually Virginia, but it does give you an idea, after the railroad is constructed, what it probably looked like. You know, a Civil War era 
rail car and the rail itself is only 11 feet wide. That's that's about from this post to this post, maybe a little bit less. So imagine a gauge rail, <coughs> and it was a it was a it's unlike the gauge that you see today. The Civil War era railroad gauge is arched. It's just like a loop. Today it looks like a T. The wheels actually lock on the tracks a lot easier today. In those, era, in those days, it was pig iron. You know, all that had to be hammered out, and it was it was produced. And y'all know about the iron industry, especially around here. And a lot of the pig iron that was being produced was produced locally for some of the rails that were being made here. Um, these, what you're seeing right here, would have been a, a typical train that would have left Nashville with guards standing on the top. This area, especially Stewart County, especially Charlotte, Tennessee, Montgomery County, all this area was one of the worst Confederate guerrilla act, action areas in the entire Civil War. You may have heard of Alexander Duval McNary and his men. They regularly attacked the trains from Kings and Springs to Johnsonville on a day-to-day on a -day basis. Talk about a book by itself. That could be an entire book if somebody... <laughs> Maybe that's the next book for somebody in this room. But uh, some fascinating stories going on right here in this community. All right, next slide. That's just a map that shows you. <coughs> Try not to get into my slide. Here's Johnsonville. This is Reynoldsburg. They initially were going to take the railroad to Reynoldsburg. Because Reynoldsburg was an existing town. It's just that Lucas Landing had more of frontage to establish the landing that they needed. So if the Union was going to build defense works, which they eventually did, and there's two forts there today, that means they could clear cut and from this location have a view two miles upriver to Reynoldsburg Island and two miles, excuse me, downriver and two miles upriver in either direction. They could see any approaching vessel that they needed to. Whether that was going to be a Confederate vessel, that begs description. But they did think that Lucas Landing was a much better strategic location, which is why the railroad went there and is still there today. But that's a Civil War era map. I believe that's the Wharton map. Yeah, that's Lieutenant Colonel Wharton, who was an engineer that eventually made all these maps just as the war was wrapping up. Okay, next, next slide. We don't want to see his face anymore tonight. Um, but he he does arrive at Johnsonville after it's constructed. It arrives there on May the 19th to officially open the place. And after a small dedicatory speech, he steps out on the back of a caboose, supposedly. And there was a gathering crowd of civilians and quartermaster employees, probably some Navy and some Army personnel that came around the back of this caboose. Somebody out of the crowd stood up and handed him a wine bottle. And after this flowery, dedicatory speech, he supposedly stepped down off the caboose, smashed it over some rails that happened to be lying, laying near the train, and names the place after himself. So what does that tell you? Wouldn't that be fun to just find a, a, an, area, an area of woods and this becomes Reynoldsville or Wootenburg or something like that? Okay. So that's how the name looked. This is uh, This is David Meagers. He's a good friend of mine. He did all the artist work in my book. But in 1991-92, he's a trained naval artist, bird's eye view artist as well. But what he did here is he took the five existing photographs that Coonley took, put them together into this bird's eye image. This is a huge drawing. I mean, it's it's this big, and I, this has been reduced down, so it's hard to see. But it gives you an idea, possibly, what the 90-acre compound at Johnsonville looked like in the, during the Civil War. You can see the wharf, you can see the steepness, you can see the double warehouses on the bank where, that was used to receive the supplies. Okay, next slide. So the quartermaster's apartment runs the operation there at the wharf. Next. Now, James Donaldson, is, he's a West Point classmate of the Quartermaster General Montgomery Meigs. He's actually given command of the massive Nashville Supply Depot. And Donaldson will eventually oversee the operations at Johnsonville. The next man that's actually put in charge at Johnsonville 
and he's a huge part of, of the story that you read in the book, is quartermaster Henry Hallen from Ohio. He and his brother Walter shared quarters in a building somewhere on that 90-acre compound, um, but he would run the operation. He would run the supply operation. Without going into a lot of detail about how they got their ranks, you had acting assistant quartermasters and you had assistant quartermasters. If you were an assistant quartermaster in the Civil War, that means you got usually a presidential recognition to be able to receive the rank of a captain. If you were an acting assistant quartermaster, a AAQ, which was usually an abbreviation of your title, that was generally done on a local level by a judge or a congress or a representative of your area or a district. But anybody that was that held the rank of an assistant quartermaster generally was a presidential appointment. He's no exception. Henry Hallen actually received his commission directly through Montgomery Miggs by a recommendation from Miggs directly to President Lincoln. So yes, in a roundabout way, it was very politicized. It was very political. Okay. This gives you an idea. It's a Civil War era drawing of when they came in there and they carved out Johnsonville. You can see they just they failed every tree in there. And they ended up building two forts, a lower fort and an upper fort. When you visit the park today, both of those forts are still intact. They're in immaculate preserved condition. They've been sitting out in the woods protected by a canopy of oak trees for 155 years. Uh, immaculately preserved. So if you get a chance, make sure you go in and take a look at these two forts. That's Coonley. He's the one that took the photographs I mentioned earlier. Um, at the time, he's 24 years old. He had started out as a painter, as a sign painter, eventually got into portraits. And then, of course, the Panic of 1857 happens, and he gets into the more profitable Daguerreotype photography. And that's when he goes to the studios of Alexander Gardner in Virginia, learns a little trade there, and eventually winds up in Tennessee under the tutelage of George Bernard, <laughs> who takes the famous photographs of the Atlanta campaign and of the Nashville campaign. But he is, Coonley is quite the photographer. He, he has quite a career after the Civil War, um, makes, becomes friends with Ernest Hemingway, eventually dies in Key West, Florida in 18 and 1890s. Okay. So what I'm going to show you now are those five plates. This is plate number one. I did take these from the negatives. Um, what you're looking at there, sorry I don't have my pointer. I, Open it up to come here, Murphy's Law, and all the batteries have exploded inside of it. Um, this hill, this is a barracks building. These are administrative buildings. Howland probably lived in one of a building like that. Keep in mind, there was a there was 180 buildings in this 90-acre compound, so there was a lot of construction going on. You can see the rails here. You can see the, a lot of the railroad ties, and you can see this road particularly right here in the middle. So go to the next slide. When you go to Johnsonville, that's what it looks like today. I took that photograph last year. So go, go back to the original slide. So this hill, when you go to Johnsonville, now go forward, is this right here. Here's the road in front. Very little, very, very little has changed there being in such the rural area that it is. Go to the next slide, please. The second photograph was this. It's the only known pre-Civil War photograph of the town of Johnsonville. Coonley set his camera up on top of the railroad bed. You can see it sloping up to the right. He turned his tripod back toward the direction of Nashville and took this shot. And it's the, the slide is blown up here, but the actual image now with digital photography, really can focus in on all the buildings back there. And you can see the, the early building of the town of Johnsonville. Some of those later pictures that TVA took before flooding the town, some of those buildings in those photographs are quite apparent still here being constructed in 1864. So this is, this is my favorite photograph, because it not only shows a civilian town, and all, you know, all of us being here, like I said, I grew up in Clarksville. You know, our family was an original Clarksville family, the Bumpuses, that were, had been there since the 1790s. But, it, you know, in the, in the 1930s, Camp Campbell 
you know, a military institution came in to Clarksville. Well, you had civilians, and my mother was one of them, she worked out there for years, went, that went to work for the Army. Well, a hundred years prior to that, you've got the same thing happening here. You've got a civilian town, Johnsonville, that's built up. The Army comes in, and they need a workforce. So a lot of these civilians that are living in the town go to work, just like those at Fort Campbell, into the military supply depot. The interesting thing about this is that it's a union operation. Who do you think those locals are that are living in the town? They're, they've got ancestors in the Confederate Army. So you have this direct connection to, a, to information that was coming you know, by workers themselves, coming directly out of the Union Supply Depot of any activity that may be en route to Nashville or other areas by the Union Army itself. So there was quite an intelligence breakdown uh, probably that was taking place here, and a lot of that came to fruition during the Battle of Johnsonville. Um, one last thing about this. You can see that all the trees are gone, but you see tarps over the top of this. These would have been wooden shaped buildings. There's a, there is evidence of that through, through Atwood's letters that definitely show that he talks about these being roof buildings. During the battle, a massive fire swept across the depot. I think it burned the roofs off these buildings. You can see all the charred trees behind it. You can see they're just solid black. This is evidence of war. You're seeing a photographer taking pictures, just like the Battle of Nashville tomorrow, giving us evidence of what the remain, remnants of a, of a battle that took place just a week before this would have may have looked like. What's very fascinating down here, you see a lot of artifacts of war. You see shoes lying on the ground. It just, it just demonstrates this massive Union war machine and every, everything they were producing, you know, even a couple of shoes were so expendable that the Confederates would have been in such need of just to have a pair of those shoes. So this kind of shows you at this point in the war, the, the, the massive Union war machine was really kicking in. So go to the next slide. That's what that area looks like today. This is Trace Creek back here. This is a low-lying area there in the park, but it's that same general area. Next slide, please. Okay, so when, when the trains came into Johnsonville, there was a section of track that split off into, in, basically into two, two sections of track. This spur that went north went to a single-roofed warehouse that was the length of two football fields. This one went to a massive double roofed warehouse that's depicted right here, and that Atwood in his letters talks about quite frequently, which is depicted right here. That's the lower fort, and somewhere up in here was the upper fort. You can see a loading platform here. There were a couple of block houses along the way as you entered the compound. Go to the next slide, please. Okay, this is Coonley's third photo. This is the massive double roof warehouse. Lots of neat stuff going on here. You see, you see African American black soldiers with overcoats on, something you rarely see in any Civil War photograph. You see the two sections of track with a mechanical system that pulls supplies up a pulley system around to this side that's off the frame of the photograph where they could load the trains with supplies from both sides of the cars. Right here, underneath this roof, are just stacks and stacks of blankets and wheelbarrows and pickaxes. Board and mat construction. I'll tell you, that photograph speaks a lot. Go to the next one. That's where, that's the area of what it looks like today. And uh, Clint, I think those are your guns, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but this, kind of gives you some idea today of what it looks like with the flooded river. If you look across that deep blue water today is the center 60-foot channel of the Tennessee River. So when they when TVA flooded the Tennessee River, all that backwater that you see that's not the dark blue is what formed the Kentucky Reservoir. So where this filled in, and I've walked out here, it's only about three feet deep. It comes up just below my waist. Then when you get out there at the end, you can feel it really cold and you start hitting the macadamized 
section of the wharf. You gotta be very careful. There's a lot of debris out there. You know, the Army Corps of Engineers left a lot of stuff out there when they dredged the rivers in the 1920s. But right here is where that massive double roof warehouse sat. This right here, out in the middle of the, what is in the middle of the lake today, is the post-Civil War era of 1867 Bridge Pier, which eventually the railroad bed, which is right there where you see those trees, crossed the Tennessee River. And it was the first place, if you were going from Nashville to Memphis, if you wanted to cross this river, you did so at Johnson. And that's one of the reasons why the town exploded after the Civil War. Okay, next slide. Sorry, that's kind of faded out with the lighting of that thing. But this back here shows the fort and a lot of the buildings. This is a sawmill in the middle. And this is that northern spur. Coonley is now has his camera sitting on top, still still up there. He just turned it in this direction. So he's he's just up there with his crew, turning his camera in different directions, making these photos. And I can't tell you how important it is to have photographs from a Western theater site of the Civil War. It's almost it's really rare. A lot of those photographers, if you remember, Alexander Gardner, Matthew Brady. They were, they were photographing the war, but only on the Eastern Front, on the Eastern Theater. So having Western Theater photographs, such as Atlanta, Nashville, and these five from Johnsonville, is incredibly important, especially the Civil War historians. Okay, next. That's just a highlight of that sawmill right here. I think that, I go with that in the book, but I think that's the first building that was constructed at Johnsonville. And it would produce over 400 square feet, lumber feet, of, of board lumber that would have been used to construct a lot of the buildings that you see there at the base of the hill. Okay, next. When you go to Johnsonville today, um, you still see this. It's like it, it's, it's just been out there, just runs right into the water. The railroad bed is, is there. It's been in the same spot since it was built in 1864. You can park your car right up there walk right down the hill and walk out on our original Civil War railroad bed. Um, all the ties, everything are still there. It's an artifact in, its, in itself. Okay, next. So this area is what the next slide is going to be. I thought I'd throw a winter shot in there since it's December. Okay, next. So his last photo, which is the most famous, it became the cover of my book. And it's in most Civil War era photography books. Um, shows the centerpiece of the depot itself. This is these guns right here. There's there's ten cannon with unlimbered unlimbered cannon and the caissons used to pull those artillery pieces. Way back here is a six-acre horse corral. I was able to blow up that horse corral so much you can actually see the horses in there. You can also see right here, sorry I don't have my pointer, I keep getting it away, but this guy, he's a white officer. All these are black soldiers. If you ever saw that movie Glory, you know, where the you got the 54th Massachusetts that are the black troops being led by white officers. Well, that's going on here as well. You've got, you've got the white officer, he, he actually turned, looked at Coonley's camera. All of these soldiers have their back toward the camera. There's one guy here, he's looking at the camera. Sitting off to the left is a McClellan saddle sitting right here. There's just all kinds of neat things in here. You see back here, there's a guy that's cooking in a fire. You see the, some of the soldier barracks over here that are logged with canvas tops. This right here is the Tennessee River. So when you go to Johnsonville today, you're parking your car about right here, and you have this view. We actually opened up that view where you can see that again. There hasn't been much that's changed there. Some of the backwater has flooded this area, but mainly where these loading ramps are is still dry land today. Okay, next. That's the view of what that looks like today. This is Pilot Knob across the river. There's another state park over there called Nathan Bedford Forest State Park. Um, this is the area of Johnsonville. This is that area that you were just looking at. I believe at that time we were burning some brush down here, and that's what that is. Okay, next. 
1937, TVA, as you all know, built the locks and dam system. Uh, Gilbertsville, Kentucky was the last one. You know, when you're going to Paducah on I-24 today, if you look off to your left, you see that dam, that's the last one. So in 1944, um, it filled up the back area of the Tennessee River that included Johnsonville, and the town of Johnsonville was flooded. They knew this was going to happen, and in 1939, they did aerial flights over this area, over the Tennessee River Valley, and took multiple shots of the town of Johnsonville. What's so special about this is all the Civil War era photographs I've been showing you lately. You can see a bird's eye, you can see a sky view of it now. Here's the northern spur. Now keep in mind, you know, this is 60 years after the Civil War. It's still there. It curves around this way. And here's the southern spur right here. I mean, here, excuse me, here's the central line. There's the bridge that spans the river. And then the central spur that went this way is still right there. This is the town railroad depot. And then the white section of town, the white residents of town, lived right here. So when that was flooded, all their cemeteries were moved. So when you go to the park today, you'll see two cemeteries up on top of the hill. Those are the reinterments of the white section of town, and those cemeteries were right here and right there. Where would Highway 70 be today? Would it be even in this picture? Highway 70 would be way off over in this direction. Okay. And that was put in in 1930. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, at that point, it's there, you know. Um, and it, they're still building it from Memphis at that point. But it's, it's off in this direction. You know, DuPont shows up in 1949 to start clearing land, and then they open the plant in um, 1956. And it's, it's part of this property that eventually is, becomes Johnsonville. But that does give you a really good idea still in 1939 what an unflooded Tennessee River looked like when the Confederates attacked the depot in 1864 and they set up in these natural levees right here. You can see at this time that land is being farmed. You can see a lot of, at the time of the Civil War, this was heavily wooded, so much that the Union Army sent troops across the river to clear that uh, from being attacked. Okay, let's keep going. What time is it? This is a railroad turntable that turned the trains as they came in. <coughs> Next slide, we're going to have to increase it. That's what it looks like today. Go back a little bit. When you go out there, if you see this connection right here, and then go back to the model. Sorry, I usually am switching this myself. This is called an arm. So when the trains came in from Nashville, there was a pivot track right here that as the engines pulled onto that track, you'd have three or four men down here with these big poles that would stick them in sockets <coughs> and turn this arm around back in the direction of Nashville. Then they would switch back onto another section of track, back the engine down, hook up to the loaded supply cars, and that's how they would keep this continuous flow of supply rail cars going back and forth to Nashville. All right, next. So, all right. that gives you an idea of what the Union forces consisted of at Johnsonville. About 2,200 men. Let's keep going. Charles Thompson was the officer, 24-year-old officer that was placed in charge of the infantry garrison at Johnsonville. So, you know, I was wasn't sure I was be, would be able to locate a photograph of him and a man that I located, there was a relative that had this in a private collection in Illinois, unbelievably had, had Thompson's image, Charles Thompson. That's him as a 24-year-old young man. You can see here he's a, he's a captain. He becomes a full <coughs> colonel at the age of 24, so he's probably 22 years old here. Obviously, he's in the military at that point. Okay, next. So you also had Navy personnel. This is the acting... Volunteer lieutenant in charge of the Navy there, Edward King. Go ahead. This shows you some of the other USCTs and United States Colored Troops that were garrisoned there. This gives you an image of what one of those looked like. You had all the Navy tin clads, so 
There's a number of vessels that are owned by the United States Navy that services Johnsonville, but there were actually four gunboats, and those gunboats were the USS Tawa, the Key West, the Elfin, and the Undyne. Tom, um, King's flagship, which means the ship that he was in charge of, was the USS Key West. And it was a massive gunboat, number 32, and there is a photograph that exists of that boat. This is some of David Meager's wonderful drawings of what those boats look like since there's not photographs. Um, there, are, there is one photo, but a lot of these boats had sister ships that did have a photograph, and he took those images to make the drawings that you see here, some of the profile sh the shots. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to give you the Battle of Johnsonville in five minutes. <laughs> so you have Confederate forces that show up in 1864. As I mentioned earlier, Forrest was oper he was ordered to operate in this area to retrieve new recruits and especially mounts for his men. Because at that time, the infantry that was serving under him were almost all mounted. General James Chalmers still had foot infantry and so did, uh, so did Abraham Buford. But other than those two, most of the men that were riding with Forrest at that time, and he had a force of about 2,800 if you included the artillery, most of them were mounted. You gotta think, it's late in the war. There have been, there have been multiple raids by both armies into West Tennessee looking for mounts all through the war. So to find serviceable horses late in 1864, you can understand how that would be challenging. So his focus was to move into Western Kentucky, into the areas of Mayfield, Kentucky, Hickman, and Paducah to try to round up more horses. In eight, earlier that, in that year, there was a battle that took place at Paducah in, in Force's third raid into that area to try to also secure mounts. So he was doing this all over again in late 1864. There's the man himself. Next. That's just a synopsis of the campaign. There, there was, just real quickly, his orders, his orders to go into Tennessee there. <coughs> Sever Sherman's communications, delay General Thomas at Nashville from concentrating troops, and assist John Bell with the movement in the Middle Tennessee. That was his primary goal. Go ahead. I'll quickly go through his division commanders. There's bigger General James Chalmers over forces. Um, first division, he would have had the majority of the men that were with force, and that was about almost 500 men. So next, Abraham Buford um, made up force the second division. He would have had a considerable number of mounted infantry. A lot of these were Kentucky troops, the 3rd Kentucky, the 7th, and the 12th Kentucky mounted infantry units. And then the boy hero of the story, the 24-year-old John Morton, who eventually became one of Tennessee's governors later on, who wrote one of the fantastic accounts of the Battle of Johnsonville, and I use a lot of Morton in my book. He's described quite often in here. So he's a captain right there. He's made in May of 1864. He's given Forrest, puts a lot of hope in this young man, and places him in charge of all of his artillery. So you start seeing him, his units referred to as Morton's artillery. So John Morton right here plays a big role in this upcoming battle. So they eventually make their way into Kentucky and occupy these works at Fort Hyman. That's a picture of what they look like today. Uh, if you've been up there, it's, it's a unit of the Fort Donaldson National Battlefield. Those are some really well-preserved earthworks. Unfortunately, back in the late 80s, early 90s, people started building houses up in there. So it's, it's really sporadically populated with houses in between a lot of these Confederate earthworks. Wonderful views of Kentucky Lake from up there, which I can certainly understand why. So the Undyne, eventually the gunboat USS Undyne is captured at Paris Landing on October 29th. And they also succeed in capturing another transport boat en route from Johnsonville. So. Force captures the USS Undyne and the Venus, which is a transport boat, the Undyne being a gunboat. This is the USS Nymph, 
which I mentioned earlier, he had, there was a number of sister ships that Meager used. This is one of those. That's what the Undyne looked like. These are the naval vessels that were seized or destroyed by forces troops between October 29th and 30th. And keep in mind, all this is happening not at Johnsonville yet, but up in the area of Fort Hyman, in Kentucky. They'll eventually make their way 40 miles from Paris Landing and end up across the river from Johnsonville. But these are some of those vessels. I might mention, if you're familiar with the Paris Landing Bridge, when you're crossing Kentucky Lake today on Paris Landing Bridge and you look off to your left and you see where the state park is located and they have their beachfront and their hotel, if you look a little bit further south, um, that's where the Big Sandy Island came in and intersected with the Tennessee River. The J.W. Cheeseman was actually set afire by Confederate troops because she participated in a part of the engagements here. She turned out not to be serviceable for the Confederates, so they fired her, set her afire right at the foot of the section of where the Big Sandy runs into the Tennessee River. You can see that from the bridge. I don't recommend stopping on top of the bridge. But if you look off there, um, the J.W. Cheeseman today sits in about 30 feet of water right there. Um, and mentioning that, the Tennessee River still today between Paris Landing and Muscle Shoals, Alabama, has the largest collection of inland river water, Civil War wrecks from the, from the entire war out of anywhere else in the United States. So <clears throat> they think some 40 to 50 vessels are in the Tennessee River between Paducah and Muscle Shoals, Alabama. So <clears throat> this is Reynoldsburg Island. Johnsonville is up here. Keep in mind, when you're talking about Navy, when you say downriver, it's north. So if you're downriver, that would have been going toward Paris Landing. If you're, looking, if you're saying upriver from Johnsonville, you've been thinking of Muscle Shoals, Alabama. So you've got these boats that come and engage the Confederates that end up occupying those captured vessels. And there's a battle the day before November the 4th called the Battle of Reynoldsburg Island, which is a massively engaged Civil War naval battle, um, almost as much as the, pretty, probably even more than the um, flotilla engagement that takes place at Fort Donaldson in, on February of 1862. But right here along the island, the island is still there today. The Corps of Engineers have dredged most of it out, but there still is a remnant of it today. A lot of artifacts have floated up from the battle, that some of the boats that were engaged in this area. Okay, next. Right here is the USS Key West, which was King's flagship. Go ahead. So, eventually forces troops, forced troops, make their way to Johnsonville and establish themselves across the river. So one of the reasons why the Battle of Johnsonville has so little casualties is because they're making this attack from across a waterway of almost 400 yards. So it's not like the Battle of Shiloh where they got opposing forces battling out, smashing each other face to face. So you've got... A, Eventually, you've got 12 gun positions that four sets up very strategically behind natural barriers. And at 2 o'clock on November the 4th, these officers synchronize their watches. And part of sections, part of Brown's battery, which is a section of Morton's battery, ma makes the first shot. Their targets eventually, eventually are to set afire the mountainous supplies stockpiled on the wharf just across the river. This is not that great of a depiction of what that looked like, but it does give you some idea. They were much closer than that. All right. Immediately, the, the black gunners inside the fort, this is a better picture of Kimley's photograph. This right here is Fort Johnson. That right there is a African-American soldier standing on top of the parapet wall in a poncho. And that's one of the shots that he takes, but Right here where you see these embrasures were gun, were gun ports. And they, the Union gunners fired back at the Confederates across the river. Did very little effect because of the elevation of the fort. It was, they were much higher 
whereas the Confederates were really embedded into the riverbank. You can still see today this road that comes right in front of the fort. There's some evidence of it that still exists there. That's what the Fort Johnson looks like today. Pure chaos. So, you know, Forrest, who had been in almost every battle in the Western Theater, said that the engagement at Johnsonville was the most terrific of fire I had ever witnessed. So, at that time, you know, you had gun, you had these seacoast artillery pieces that were on these gunboats that backed out into the middle of the channel. They enfiladed the Confederates, and at that time, over 50 guns were brought on to Forrest and his men that had been dug in behind these natural levees. So there's this massive artillery battle that takes place there. And Johnsonville is primarily a, an artillery battle. There is some small arms fire. A lot of the troops from both sides run to the edge of the river, and they start firing small, small arms back and forth across this river channel. So at some point during that battle, whether it was Henry Howland or one of the other Union commanders, they lose their nerve. They think the Confederates are going to cross the Tennessee River and capture Johnsonville. How the heck they're going to ford the Tennessee River, I'm still, it's a big mystery to me. But somehow they thought that they were going to ford the Tennessee River and take Johnsonville from the rear. And this was very realistic because you got to think, what was the biggest event, news event, of 1864 in the Western Theater. It was the Battle of Fort Pillar. Same thing going on here. You got, you got black troops inside of a fort. They're, they're attacked by Confederates. They think it's going to be another Fort Pillar. So fearing this, Thompson orders Howland to go aboard the 26 Union vessels that are docked at the wharf and start setting them afire. The Confederates can't believe their eyes. They're so much so, they even start screaming across the river, saying, no, don't burn these beautiful vessels. Don't burn them. And they, they watch these sailors go on board, and they start setting these transport boats on fire. Now, whether that was just losing your nerve or inexperience, that was one of the mysteries I had to figure out in the book. And I, I come up, I think, with the best synopsis that I could on why that may have happened. But you'll have to read the book. <laughs> I have to leave a little mystery for you something. Okay, next. So the Confederates eventually withdraw from Johnsonville after the battle in the direction of Corinth, Mississippi. They, they make their route that night to Perryville, Tennessee in some of the worst rainy conditions ever experienced in the, in the Western Theater of the War. Um, Forrest remains behind with Rucker's Brigade. The battle resumes the next day. So it's not just November the 4th, November the 5th, there's a huge artillery engagement that takes place once again beginning at 7.30 in the morning. And there is firing that goes on across that river all day long. When I was manager there in 2015, a local woman came into the office and she said, Hey, I've got this, I've got this Civil War shell that my deceased husband had in his garage using it as a doorstop. I'm like, really? You know, does it? Is it, is it diffused? She's like, I don't know. And I'm, so we went over there and looked at it, and it was a Hotchkiss shell. If you know, I know Clint knows what I'm talking about. But it's, it, it's, a, it's a type of shell that's, I don't know, it's about that big. But um, it's one of those that was actually fired that missed their targets, that made it into where the area of New Johnsonville, the town of New Johnsonville, was back, actually constructed high up on the hill. So, you know, there's shells all over those hills down there today that must have been embedded into the, the backsides of the hills. Um, so, a huge artillery battle. If you ever want to study artillery, study the Battle of Johnsonville if you want to learn more about what, what happened there. Anyway, the last, the last shots of the Battle of Johnsonville are fired about 7 p.m. on November the 5th. Here's the next. Um, Again, I'm sorry we're out of time, but this is where the warehouse number one is that was fired. The, the smaller warehouse caught fire during the battle, and it burns to the ground right here. Some of the boats that were sank happened right here. And there's four of those boats that are still out there today. They're in about 15 feet of water. 
Um, there's been four underwater archaeological dives as, since I was manager there beginning in 2010. Uh, we, we recovered lots and lots of artifacts off of those boats. Um, the park does not own the artifacts. You know, any artifact uncovered in an inland river in the United States is the, is the property of the United States Navy. So those artifacts, most of them went to the Bethesda Naval Yard and near Washington, D.C. I would love to get what belongs to Tennessee back to Tennessee. But anyway, they're, they're there, they're being curated. Um, when I left there as manager, I was in good communication with the curator that was overseeing a lot of those artifacts that came off those boats. Some of those did come back to the museum. If you go down there today, you can see some of the artifacts that were uncovered. Okay, next. Those are some of the Union losses at Johnsonville. Estimated at that time, look at it, 6700000 I'm sure that would be over a billion dollars today or even more. Next. You can see the Confederate losses at Johnsonville were very little. Two men killed, nine men wounded. One of those men killed was from a limb that was struck by a Union gunner's shell busted the limb off and fell across the neck of one of the Confederate gunners and broke his neck. Um, and then, of course, nine men wounded. I'm not sure exactly who, because any of the records, I never saw from what unit those men were. Next. John Schofield comes in, you know, he's very famous at that time. If you know anything about the Battle of Franklin, John Schofield's troops were the ones that were defending the Carter House. So when all the Confederates under John Bell Hood attacked right up the gut of the Columbia Turnpike. Schofield's men were there. So that's our connection to the Battle of Franklin because prior to being right there at the Carter House, he left Johnsonville being the reinforcement troops that came in the next day. They were responsible for helping build the upper fort, reinforcing the upper fort that you see there today. And that's what it looks like. It's an immaculately preserved fort sitting out in the middle of the woods. And a lot of those you go to Fort Donaldson, the CCC added a lot of dirt on top of those walls and built those walls up in the 1930s. This has been sitting here as an artifact since 1864 untouched. So that's what you see. That's a massive earthen work that's still in existence today. So eventually, on November 30th, and ironically the same day as the Battle of Franklin, the final train of stores upon order by General Thomas to abandon Johnsonville, leaves the depot, and all the stores at Johnsonville are brought to Nashville. Because about this time, uh, John Bell Hood is threatening Nashville after the Battle of Franklin. So for those next two weeks, you know, today being the last day when they make their attack tomorrow, um, all the equipment that eventually was there, most of it, they got out of there on the last trains. So as the bloodbath is unfolding in Franklin, the last train leaves Johnsonville on November the 30th. So there's the results. Johnsonville was a tactical victory for the Confederates. Strategically, however, Forrest's victory had little effect against Sherman's massive war machine, which was about to be moving rapidly through Georgia. One third of Johnsonville's supply depot was destroyed on November 4th and 5th. <coughs> Next. So the aftermath, so. After the two-week-long campaign, it not only resulted in their near-complete destruction of Johnsonville's depot, but it unfortunately it rendered the National and Northwestern Railroad useless. So after a year and millions of dollars constructing this railroad without Johnsonville, it's just like Howard Hughes delivering those airplanes when the war ended. They didn't need them anymore. There were so many government contracts like that in the Civil War, and this was one of those. So basically, it's rendered useless. There is a small regiment that goes back to Johnsonville to defend the post from 1865 to the end of the war, but the loss of the base there left Thomas in Nashville doubtful of the future use of the Tennessee River as a supply base. And then after that, finally, Sherman's response to the people of Georgia, as the, as the rebels have destroyed our base of supplies, the rebel citizens must furnish our substance, you will bear the brunt of the after effects. And what those after effects were, were his famous march to the sea. You've heard Sherman left Atlanta and made the 60 mile swath 
to this town of Savannah, because of the actions that take place right here, General Forrest makes his most famous quote of the entire Civil War that you never hear. It actually became a title of a book called That Devil Forest. But the continuation of that quote was, had to do right here where we're living, that devil forest dot 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 was down about Johnsonville wreaking havoc on the gunboats again. So that's his, basically, one of the chief causes that eventually leads him on a campaign through Georgia. And last but not least, there's the book. Um, I'll be glad, I have these for sale today, I'll be glad to sign those if, if any of you would like to pick up a copy. I know I'm a little bit over time, Melissa, but no, I'd like good. to get the lights back on and I'll spend any time that you need in the next five minutes answering any questions that somebody might have. I know that's a lot thrown at you there. Let your, let your eyes kind of get used to the sunlight. <laughs> I didn't know I was that thorough. But um, anyway, it's always a pleasure to talk to local groups about the story. There's so much detail involved of what unfolded out of the Battle of Johnsonville. If you get a chance and you haven't been down there, take some time, especially in the winter, because I can tell you right now the ticks and chickers are rampant in the summer, so if you want to avoid that, take a winter stroll down there. You can really see the terrain and get into the forts. Um, it is a very personal story to me. I'm glad that someone, I guess being myself, finally stepped up and told this. You know, I'm, I have a deep Confederate lineage, but I told a story about a Union supply depot that was very desperately needed in the historiography of the American Civil War. Um, most of the accounts that I had read about Johnsonville came out of Confederate veteran magazine, Confederate perspectives. I wanted to know more than that. I wanted to know more than what you just heard in the last 30 minutes of, of this Confederate force attacking the depot, and eventually that became Johnsonville's legacy. Johnsonville's legacy is that it's still, today, it's still relevant as a state park. You know, the story has the only state park system, the two state parks out of the whole park system out of all 50 United States in our country that has a, a certain single event identified by two parks, Johnsonville and Nathan Bedford Forest State Park. They both tell the same story. So if that's not important, I beg, differ, I beg the difference to know what other event, especially in Tennessee, between Shiloh and Fort Donaldson, which was just as important. And thank you for your support today. Um, if anybody would like to ask any questions or further ask me something after the event, I'll be glad to talk to you and thank you for having me here tonight. Oh, yes. Um, fascinating. Very good presentation. I want to ask you a deep question. I love it. Why you? What is it inside you that made you do this? Well, for one reason, I had to get a grade out of this. <laughs> <laughs> but um, beside that, being a local kid, um, and being a, as Clint knows, a life, I mean, he's known me since I was 10, <laughs> no. at least, maybe 12. Uh, just being a, a, a lifelong lover of the American Civil War in, in the Western Theater, so much of the historiography and the books that are being published out there are almost always about <coughs> Eastern Theater. <coughs> Lee, Jackson, and all those guys, which is great stuff. But there's a gap in Western theater history. And we had, you know, being in the Park Service, you know, we've got visitors that come from all over the country to Tennessee to learn Civil War history. So I, I just saw this, you know, all they ever got to was Fort Donaldson, then they make their trip right past Johnsonville through Houston County, Stewart, Houston County, and they skip Johnsonville and they drive straight to Shiloh. And I'm like, man, here's a fascinating story that's got to be told. So I just thought, you know, whether I was at the right place at the right time, I was manager at the park, I still have, a, I still have as much desire and love of that story as I did six years ago when I was writing it. You know, this, I knew in 2012 when we had to, being a PhD student, you have to come up with a dissertation topic. 
and being a public history major, I knew that, okay, being on site, I can have a feel for the terrain. You know, I'm in direct connection to ancestors of people that had soldiers that lived there. So there's all these things at work that just made sense to me that writing this story, I don't know, maybe it was one of those times where it was like, okay, Jerry, maybe you're the person that's supposed to write this. Maybe you're the right guy, the right place to be here at that time. So, yeah, it was a, it's a very personal journey for me. And, um, you know, I, I loved every minute of it. I mean, like I said, I spent seven years collecting resources and three years writing the story. I learned a lot about the publishing world that I don't, still don't understand. But um, as my first book, as a publishing historian, I'm very proud of it. What you've done, I, for me, you filled in a lot of gray areas that I would have never known. Well, and you know, and I told Melissa trying to I, trying to cram this into a 50-minute story. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay. You, your time is trying. There is a lot of information with this, yeah. um, and I've, 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 I don't know if that's me or maybe that's maybe that's the the other stopwatch telling me I need to shut up. Um, but I think that this is. You know, we're at the point now with Civil War historiography, since we passed the 150th anniversary, and the climate of the world the way that it is right now, um, Civil War is not as popular as it once was. So it's going to be up to young historians to keep that idea alive, and I want to do that. I feel like I, I need to be a big part of that. And the Johnsonville story, I think, is is a big section of that. You know, it's as Will Green quoted on the front. And I, I didn't ask him to write this; he just came up with it. But he says, "Definitely fills an important void in the story of the America's Civil War's Western Theater." And he couldn't have said it better because this was one of those. You know, there's, there's tons of them. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, McNary and the Confederate actions, the guerrilla attacks that are going on in this area, is an entire book. Um, the, you know, you hear about Quantrill and the guerrilla actions in Missouri, but you never learn about Alexander Duval McNary and his men that were really attacking these supply trains coming back and forth, especially the Union soldiers that were in the area of Charlotte, Tennessee. That was a hotbed of Confederate guerrilla action. So, um, so there's a lot of good stories out there that still need to be told. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll be glad to. I, thank you all for having me here tonight. I hope you all have a very Merry Christmas. I'll be up here, sign books after we're done. Thank you. Thank you all. We have some to-go plates here if you want some to-go. The uh, candy canes on your table are for you if you don't have enough for you or your grandchildren or whatever. I've got some more up here, and I hope to see you in January. Thank you.